And there's no doubt about it that if, as Britain threatened last year to cut down, among other services, the Somali services, that other countries hostile to Britain's interests would immediately step in. In the broadcasting league today, Britain is not at the top. She's somewhere down in the second division. And to go further down to the third division would mean to say people are going to get promoted. It was a matter of national pride, I think, on the part of the Somalis that this service uh, should not be stopped. But if the government withdrew that service, it would be a, a slap in the face. Disaster was avoided because the government was forced to change its mind. And the reason was the enormous support we got. Certain other services were lopped a bit. Uh, the French, for example, uh, and the Portuguese service to Brazil. Now, it's very ironic that almost throughout our history, every time the Foreign Office cuts a service, you can be almost certain that within months there will be a crisis in that country or in that part of the world. And of course, that's precisely what happened uh, over the Falklands conflict. Uh, how badly we needed a very full Brazilian service at that time. However, we did have the Spanish Latin American service. It had been broadcasting for 40 years. And of course, immediately the Falklands conflict began. Millions of people started to tune in to that service throughout Latin America. Hello, Mary White back with you again with another edition of Calling the Falklands. Another aspect of this continuity was this little program that we had been broadcasting for 30 years, Calling the Falklands. And I think, quite honestly, the Foreign Office had almost forgotten about it. It cost a pittance, and all it was was a little request program. Right, if you prepared the message, and who is it to? It's to my father. Um, his name is Jack, Jack Albert, Albert, Flagstaff House, Port Stanley. Many supportive messages have been received by Mike and Dot and Bill. It proved a great lifeline. And goodness knows, Whitehall realised this. Ministers and leading officials were queuing up to get on that programme. We absolutely depended upon it for all information. You got information in England before we got it here. Uh, once the... Uh, the, when the British came and the fighting started then, we were not getting the information of what was happening at St. Carlos or uh, Goose Green. We got it through the BBC. Calling the Thorkons was able to give us, apart from the messages, of course, uh, the personal messages, it was able to give us in-depth news about the Thorkons, things that you wouldn't normally hear on the World Service, the little things, the, the little tiny small things, which to the Falkland Islander at that time was so valuable, so important, that uh, it, people, people would just be waiting. In our house, we had a lot of people living with us, sort of refugees from the top of the town. And we'd be tuning in and tuning in and saying, oh, God, where is it? Aren't they going to come on tonight? You know, 10 minutes before the program started. It was incredible value, that program. I don't think you could ever really try and tell even the BBC how valuable that program was to the Falkland Islanders. You may remember a press report from Argentina which stated that the Padre with the Argentine forces in Port Stanley had stated that not only had all the Argentine troops been listening to the BBC at the end of the conflict because they realized that Buenos Aires was broadcasting nothing but propaganda, but that the commander of the Argentine forces, General Menendez, also was listening and that it was actually the BBC broadcasts which finally persuaded him to surrender. Now, if ever one wants uh, an example of how important it is to maintain credibility during not only peacetime but also during war, surely that was it. Since martial law was imposed in Poland, the Russians have done their best to jam our broadcasts, but we're still getting through, and the response has been enormous and has aroused great irritation on the part of the Polish regime, who have protested to the British government. The BBC, for me, was really the only source of information to learn what was going on in, in Gdańsk and other towns, because there was almost no communication between towns in Poland. And the Polish sources of information at that time were not really reliable.
But we gathered in the evening, mostly or even late evenings at night, uh, to listen to the news, BBC news, and to have uh, some contact and some feeling with, that we are still a part of the rest of the world. Some people may wonder why bother to broadcast on shortwave to Japan, a country with a mass media and a very sophisticated media. But the fact is that the BBC Japanese service has half a million listeners every day. Civil servants, high government officials, politicians, business executives and so on. They are in fact the opinion formers. BBC no Nihongo Hoso ga start to shita na wa. A good selling point as far as Britain is concerned is the program. New ideas. When we pick up the latest new idea that is being brought out in Britain, we translate it and we put it back to Japan in Japanese. We have simple little things like garden hoses that fold flat. Um, we have new vending machines. We even sell digital, digital watches back to Japan. You know, we, we will sell any new British product to Japan. In Japan, they have shortwave associations. Uh, the biggest one has a following of about two or three hundred thousand. Societies all over Japan meet every week, either in high schools, universities, or in the local town, to discuss the contents of the program. We're not the only people broadcasting on shortwave to Japan. We've got a lot, lot of opposition. Um, we have one of the largest audiences, but we have the smallest amount of time. Another country not far away, and a very large country, China, is also um, a great success story. In 1978, we received 17 letters from China to the Chinese service. Two years later, after the political change in China, we received 30,000 letters. And ever since then, letters to the service have been running at about 2,500 a month. All of a sudden, China has opened up, and the really big success is Follow Me, the English by television series. This, dare I say it, makes a little bit of money for us, or even if it doesn't make money, it actually pays for itself. Hugh Howes is in charge of English by radio and television. He is our super salesman, and he's just been back to China to negotiate a further series. Part of the success of this program is Kate Flower, and it's really rather intriguing that an English girl should have become a national television star in China. It's the only television we do in the external services, and it grew out of our English by radio operation. This has almost become, I think, the coronation street of China. It goes out at a peak viewing time four times a week and has a massive audience. In lesson one, eleven, and twenty-one, you learned how to talk. Follow Me has been broadcast so far in around 40 countries. It began in Europe, in Germany, with a very large audience of nine million, and uh, 600,000 people bought the Follow Me books to study rather more carefully. 
and it's spread throughout Europe. It's now on television in, in Italy, for example, certain 21. Middle Eastern countries, Venezuela 21. in Latin America. 21. China Central Television, in presenting it on television, have made it particularly attractive because they've added presentation in Chinese. They have added explanations. Wait, let's say something. Else. Sometimes you meet someone mm -hmm. and you think you know them already. Yeah. Very often we say, haven't we met before? Can I say that? Because yeah. it's not really a way of greeting people. So, uh, a way to open conversation. But only if you really have met the person. <laughs> or you think Do you, you say have. that to a, to a person whom you have never met? No, 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 no. Only if you try to. Yes, I see. But, but actually, we've had to cut out very, very little. Yeah. Remarkably little. In fact, when I presented this program in France, uh, we had more, far more problems. Because, for example, every time we showed people drinking and getting drunk, uh, there would be loud complaints from parents saying that their children were being corrupted. Um, that, was, that was the French reaction to um, alcohol on the scene. But uh, when we've shown the same scene in China, everybody's treated it as a great joke and absolutely nothing to worry about. <laughs> there was a scene of a girl in a bubble bath, <laughs> which, which I think we replaced with a caption on the screen and, and splashing noises, which was just as effective, really. <laughs> it has been said that Kate has the most famous foreign face in the whole of China. It's impossible to know exactly how many people are following Follow Me. There are some 20 million TV sets. The number of people watching each individual television set can vary, let's say, in a family between uh, five people or in a factory, it can be as many as 40 people. My name's... It really does surprise me why so many people who will never have a chance to use their English make such a tremendous effort to learn it. How far is Brighton? It's 85 kilometres away. It's 85 kilometres away. How can we get to Brighton? How can we get by train? By train. We can get there by train. It's too expensive. It's cheaper by bus. It's faster by train. How can we get to the station? You can take a taxi. You can take a taxi. You can walk. You can walk. But it's very fast. Waiters and waitresses, uh, shopkeepers, um, workers in factories spend a lot of time and effort learning it. I can only hope for their sake that one day they will have a chance to use it. And how can we get to the station? You can take a coach. You can take coach. It's a long way from here. It's a long way from here. It's faster by train. By train. By train. <laughs> <laughs> All the flights are full. All the flights are full. You have to go on Thursday. You have to go on Thursday. Where's Charles Street down this way? Charles Street? No, it's not down here. Could you imagine in Britain that ordinary people would get up an hour earlier than they normally would to get to their factory or office just to practice the previous night's program? Hello, so, uh, Hello, good morning. Morning, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Can I see you here? Yes, please. Oh. But I'm very busy. What for? I'm making computer programs every day. I'm busy too. I'm translating English book into Chinese. What's, what's about a, what's a book about? A, a story about a former stick TV home. Oh, I see. You like stories, I think. Oh, what's the time? It's nine o'clock. Oh, I'm late. Sorry. Bye-bye. Where are you going? I'm meeting my girlfriend. <laughs> oh. <laughs> been asking me for the last six or seven months, where's the book, when's the book coming out, when's it going to be in the shops, uh, so I'm, I'm going to be happy to be able to give them a positive answer at last, it's there, go and buy it. The Book of Follow Me has just been published for the first time here in Peking. They have printed one million and two hundred copies. 
，就成一捡起来。您和这个我们这些像胡老师、袁老师主办这节目，相当受欢迎的。谢谢。我们上一次是 quite good enough to translate all of that, but the basic gist of it was that it's for the sake of international friendship that that English is very much the international language used by many different countries, and also that it's necessary for China's progress into the future as a modern state. And I think probably what he says, judging by the reaction, sums up the feelings of a lot of people. China's opened up enormously in the last three or four years, and the number of people who are coming here now is huge, both as tourists and businessmen, diplomats, teachers, and so on. I think that's one of the reasons why the program Follow Me has been such a success. I feel I'm very, very lucky to be involved in such a success story. And how can we get there? We can take a train. But it's cheaper by coach. We can go in my car. And how can we get to the station? You can take a coach. A coach is very slow. How can we get to Brighton? We can go by car. It is Britain's voice to the world. The way that we tell the world about our institutions, about the way we live, about our successes, and about some of our failures as well. The current affairs program for the French service Définir les relations franco-britanniques, c'est une gageure, c'est vrai, les clichés sont nombreux, se bousculent, sont omniprésents, et ils survivent aux années, ils survivent même au changement. Welcome to listeners to Radio New Zealand, welcome to listeners to Radio Trinidad, in fact, welcome to listeners throughout the world. Don't count the cloisters is close to the brewery. <laughs> we can all smell what they brew. And we don't care tuppence when the red day comes, cause it's close to the workhouse too. John's just snapping it now. We'll put it into third headline. Our weekly magazine of science and technology. This week we'll be talking about the computer miracle that can make the paralyzed walk again and do quasars lie in straight lines. There used to be in America, just before the Second War, an Englishman, I would guess. Right, Kenneth, 50 seconds on chivalry starting now. There are endless examples of this in the history of our country. Bodice is reputed to give an old Harridan in Dawlish a ride on her bullock cart. And the same with Walter Raleigh when he laid it down and said to Elizabeth, here, tread on that. <laughs> Their sole source of protein seems to be pre-digested, rotting meat. Now, what, what they do is they're very... It comes from, from the moral questions surrounding the beginning of life. 
That was the last book in a series of reflections by Canon George Austin, parish priest in Bushy, north of London. We are acquiring a lot of the Western Hemisphere at, at 11 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time, and we're losing some of Africa and Asia before then. I'll tell Europe about 30-minute theatre, I think.